Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Sandeepan, director at the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, Bangalore, or FAS, as many of us know it as. We are a research organization that works as a network of academics and other scholars who are interested in studying and understanding the social economic characteristics and processes taking taking place in rural India. And on behalf of FS, let me welcome you all to our fourth annual lecture. We as an organization believe that any progressive transformation of the Indian society is not possible without a progressive transformation of the rural society and rural economy, which in fact is changing at a rapid pace. And we attempt uh, to do a scientific analysis and understand that change. Our trustee, Madhura Swaminathan, Professor and Head of Economic Analysis Unit, Indian Statistical Institute, Bangalore, and the Chair of today's program, will tell you a little more about the work that FAS does. So I'll take a pause here and introduce the FAS Annual Oration uh, Series. The Annual Oration of okay. FAS is a yes. well-received academic event that is generally attended by a number of students and senior scholars agriculture scientists and social scientists from various universities and institutes. The first annual oration, as many of you would uh, recall, uh, took place here at St. Joe's University at the other hall, Zindiyas Hall. It was delivered by Professor M. S. Swaminathan, yeah. the father of the revolution in India, uh, in 20, that was in 2018. Uh, the title of whose lecture was How Science Shapes the Future uh, of Agriculture with a Focus in India. The COVID pandemic then forced us to take a pause, a big pause, and eventually we had to shift to the online mode. The second annual oration of the foundation held in 2020 was delivered online by Professor Schengen Pan, former director no, general of the understand. International Food Policy Research Institute. And this uh, lecture was titled know, Building Agricultural and Rural Resilience, the Chinese Experience. The third lecture, again online, unfortunately, was delivered in 2021 by the eminent historian, Professor Irfan Habib, who spoke on caste and agrarian relations in ancient and medieval India. And here we are, the fourth FAS annual lecture. Fortunately, we are back to the uh, physical form, and we are very happy to once again be here at the St. Joseph's University. Uh, this lecture is jointly organized uh, by the St. Joseph's University and the International Rights Research Institute. Now one can see that with this series, what we have been trying is to build a legacy of eminence. And today's talk and speaker is yet another addition to that to the list long line of eminence speakers and scholars. We have today with us Tao Dukfan. Chair of the Board of Trustees of the International Rice Research Institute, uh, the renowned international agency that led the Green Revolution efforts in South and Southeast Asia. He'll recount the experience of policy reforms in Vietnam's agriculture sector, which continues to be the, the primary source of livelihood for more than 60% of the rural population in that country and holds great significance in the economic and social development of Vietnam. Yes, in the background of these reforms, as we will listen you know, from uh, Dr. Fath, are the land policies brought about by the Vietnamese state that help the farmers of the country gain access to land use rights. We will listen more to this trajectory, this trajectory of agriculture development in Vietnam by a state speaker who was himself in the thick of things. He was in the Ministry of Agriculture Development, Agriculture in Vietnam, when this transition was taking place. So we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Tao Dukpa. With these words, let me begin the proceedings. Let me to begin with uh, call upon uh, Dr. Tao Dukpa to take his chair at the dais. Let me also call upon our chair for the event, 
uh, Madhura Swaminathan, Professor and the Head of Economic Analysis Unit. And the Pro VC of uh, St. Joseph's University would now uh, join us to felicitate uh, Dr. Park. in person, but she, uh, she is the head of ED India, and she would uh, take a few minutes to address her, us uh, online. Just give us a few seconds. Yes, yes. Oh. I'm on. I can see you. But, uh, no, but she's being. Yeah. Yeah. Small? A little bit less focus. Can you speak a little louder? Say yes. Yes, yes, we can hear you. We yeah, okay. You. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. 
Reverend Dr. Nobo, <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Dr. Park, uh, friends, I'm uh, happy to see all of you here at the fourth uh, uh, FAS annual commission. And uh, I would just like to say a few words about the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, uh, because this year we are also celebrating our 20th anniversary. Uh, so, that was started in uh, 2003 by a small group of us, persons who were concerned about the lack of serious theoretical and empirical scholarship on agrarian India. And as all of you know, uh, 75 years of independence, around 70 years of plant development, but India holds a record for the largest number of poor people in the world. And the number is anything between 400 million to 800 million or more. So I think this is not a record to put off. And to understand rural India, to understand the constraints, uh, I think without, as Sandeep mentioned, solving the problems of rural India, it will be very difficult for India to really truly advance on a path of development. Now, FAS has uh, three broad, if I can say, three broad areas of work, and at the core of it has been research, careful empirical and theoretical research, and our flagship program here is a program of study called the Project on Agrarian Relations in India, or PARI, uh, which was started in 2005. And in PARI, we have used the method of village studies, conducting in-depth, detailed studies of a village economy and society, not just a sample survey to study a few characteristics, but an in-depth study that could give us an a complete picture, understanding of how the economy works, the conditions of uh, a situation of different classes of households, particularly working uh, worker households, particularly oppression among scheduled class and scheduled tribe households, the situation of women, and many other concerns. Uh, today we have a database on 27 villages as part of Pari. We also have data on other villages studied uh, uh, by our network of scholars in other parts of India, but 27 villages in 12 states of India. Now, this is uh, a drop in the ocean uh, if you look at the population of India. But I think these sort of in depth views of uh, villages located in a diversity of uh, agroecological conditions with different sort of social structures and economic class structures have allowed us to understand the processes underlying rural change. And we have used this method of image studies to also work on specific problems. As you will see from the books, uh, some of the books we have authored which are displayed outside on the condition of Dalit households in rural India, on the condition of small farmer households, on aspects of women and work, and their work and their lives in rural India. So I uh, welcome you all to the website of the Foundation for Agrarian Studies uh, to know more about our uh, research uh, output. The second and as important, I think, uh, component of our work is dissemination, or taking the findings, taking our understanding based on uh, in-depth studies to the public, to academics, to students, to media, and to grassroots activists, to people who are actually working on the ground to bring about change. Uh, our major publication is the journal, uh, the Review of Agrarian Studies, started in 2011, a peer-reviewed online uh, first print later journal, and we're very happy that we made it to the 12th volume, uh, volume 12 of 2022 uh, has just come out in print. Uh, in addition to this, 
as I mentioned, for a series of books, working papers, blogs, and more recently, podcasts and social media posts, we try to reach some of our understanding to a wider uh, mass of people. Uh, last but not least, I think one of our mandates has been uh, to reach out to young people. And uh, I think I'm happy that most of this audience, except for the first row, is, is uh, average age, which is uh, you know, well below uh, 30. Uh, and so it is to reach out to all of you students and to take you along on our understanding, on our study of agrarian India and to bring to your attention the attention of young people. Uh, we've had young, uh, several young scholar events, we have internships, uh, we take young people on our field work and through this lecture and other conferences and events, uh, we want to uh, bring the problems of rural India, the problems of agrarian India uh, to your attention. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, there are so many of you who are here. And again, I welcome the young people to come and work with us uh, with our village data. We also work with secondary statistics and other forms of data uh, to build up a comprehensive understanding of uh, the problems of constraints uh, faced by households uh, in rural India, where we have the mass of people uh, I now turn to uh, I would like to uh, turn to today's lecture uh, we are very privileged today to have uh, Dr. Fat uh, with us uh, who has come uh, all the way from uh, Hanoi uh, I request uh, all of you to put your mobile phones on silent or switch off if possible. Uh, Dr. Fad is an agricultural economist. He studied in Belarus, Russia, and Ukraine, and then went on and did a master's at the uh, he got his PhD in Ukraine, and then did a master's in public policy at the Harvard. Kennedy School. He has worked with the Vietnamese government for I think uh, 30, 20 years. 20 years from a young man. He started in the Ministry of Agriculture as a policy advisor, became vice minister, and then was Minister of Agriculture in Vietnam for uh, 12 years, uh, 2004 to 2016. That's uh, for the 12 years. Uh, he continues to be on the advisory uh, panel of the CPB uh, and has also been the independent chair of the Food and Agriculture Organization and more recently is now the chair of the International Price Research Institute. Uh, so I do not know of any better person uh, who has actually been uh, a student of uh, agriculture, has been in the policy seat and continues to play a very important role in Vietnam in an advisory capacity to take us through the journey of agricultural development in Vietnam. Uh, welcome once again. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. It is my great honor to be here today to speak to you about an economic reform which took place in recent years in Vietnam. 
but first of all, I would like to thank the foundation of agrarian studies and in India for the invitation and for hosting this event. And I would like also to express my great to good <coughs> government and people of India for strong and continuous support to my country, Vietnam. And we always look forward to further strengthening this cooperation and friendship. As you know, in the last century, in search of the best way for national progress, nations struggle to find best economic Okay. I mean, the reform in the agricultural sector of Vietnam, which has taken place in 1986, and is recognized successful. Then, how it has been carried out, it was it in China. little bit about Vietnam is in the South East Asia. And, uh, Independent Day, 7 September 1945. Population now 100 million people. And among the rural population, 63 percent. Labor force working in our country occupied nearly 30 percent. But we have very little land. Total average 33 million hectares. And out of that, 11.7 million for agriculture. It means we have only 1,170 square meters per capita in my home village. We have to make living for every day from one square meter. So Vietnam is in tropics. It's warm and it's favorable for agriculture. And we have data of metal are very good time and among the best places for rice growing in the world. So our farmers grow this crop and raise this animal. I show you a few pictures. This is how the Tamis rice field look like in lowland and in upland. We grow coffee, we grow pepper, rubber, and of course fruit sweets. We raise chicken, pigs, and we raise buffalo and cow, and maybe some uh, mura buffalo as well. We raise fish. 
this way. And this is picture from the most modern free embracing company. Not everywhere like this, but there is such. So before the reform, in Vietnam it sounds going away. It means reform. We cut it out. Reform. When the country thus went through a number of war for freedom and independence. At that time, we follow it centrally planning economic development approach. And before the, uh, after the revolution in 1990, 1945, in the north, we distributed land to smallholders, to the landlord, uh, landlords. And the same we did after the war in the south, since 1975. But in 1980, the land decided to nationalize land. land. All land in Vietnam became national property. And at the same time, uh, we carried out a movement to create cooperative on our work. And by 1985, about 80% of farmers were members of different kinds of cooperatives. So, and on places of former colonial plantation or on large modern land area, we created state farm. In 95, state farm, agriculture land and forest, forestry uh, farm occupied nearly 23% of total acreage of the country, of the country. So, cooperative in, and state farm were dominant in our time. So, what were advantages of such system? First, farmers were with uh, each one in relation to the land. Now, the region like co-founder of uh, national land. And in that system, cooperative and state farm took care of planning, of supplying input, of selling products, between technical guidance to farmers and organizing their work. Farmers does work under guidance of the leadership of cooperative and state farm. At the same time, state could easily provide assistance to agriculture through cooperative and state farm. They small number of units to work with. The cooperative and state farm were key for economic development in the countryside, especially in the remote regions. They developed rural infrastructure and facilitated, facilitated social stability in countryside. But main failure 
of that system is that it did not provide strong enough incentive for private initiatives from farmers, especially to use resources efficiently. They work for cooperative, they work for state, and receive uh, salary or uh, share, or they were not very interested in efficiently. Farmers did not invest they are resources in cooperative and state farm. Except small share, they have to contribute at the beginning of creating cooperative. The private investment was very little. So agricultural development depended heavily on government uh, investment, which was also very tight. Because of and and as a result, productivity was low. Agricultural development depended heavily on government investment, and agricultural growth was sluggish. Some subsectors even declined. In 1980s, the country was in short of food and had to import one to million tons a year. And at that time, we were very moved and grateful to India for donation. Once was 300,000 tons to save the families from hunger. We always did that in our heart. And most farmers were poor. Forest was cut at an alarming rate. In addition to that, international situation was not favorable. The socialist bloc was only. All those factors forced Vietnam to change, and a market-oriented economic reform was chosen. In Vietnam, it means it sounds normal. Initial important decision was made at the Communist Party Congress in 1986. It is considered its beginning. And core component of the reform in agriculture were four components. Changes in the land policy, introduction of the market mechanism, restructuring cooperative and state funds, promoting private business, restructuring public services. All components were carried out not once, but step by step. They were interrelated. No reform, easy. Each step was a matter. And each step was taken after very careful analysis review of experiment and intensive policy debate. The main obstacle to the reform was that understanding of the market mechanism and establishment of the market institution took time. The most important facilitating factor was a strong 
commitment of the ruling party to the people. As to run policy change, in the past, when we started the reform, land is a national property. Before the war, most of our land, our rubber land, belong to cooperative and state farm. Farmers work in cooperatives and got shares according to quantity and quality of their labor and financial contribution. In state farm, workers receive salaries. And sometimes I work for poverty. I was the record. It was the record as class D labor. And at the end of the year, they get me something. Also. At the beginning of the work, farmers got contracts from cooperatives or state farm. So first, we apply so only contracts six So a <coughs> contract with a cooperative for rice farmers could be as follows. Farmers <coughs> were responsible for planting for taking care of rice field, for harvesting. Cooperatives were responsible for land reparation, for water management, for supply of fertilizers and other major inputs. There was an estimate of rice yield from the contract block. After the harvest, farmer has to pay to the cooperative a certain percentage of the estimated yield for services and retain the rest of the harvest for themselves. Such systems strongly encourage farmers to invest additionally to get the yield above the contract estimated yield. However, that investment was mostly shorter. Farmers were even interested in making long-term investment on land which did not belong to them. They had to invest some fertilizer and labor. For that reason, since 1993, so after six before and the beginning. Cooperative land was redistributed equally to farmers for free and monthly. So equally to everyone available at the end of 1993 in countryside. <coughs> At the beginning, the term of land use was 20 years. But now that it, it is 50 years with automatic renewal, with no problem, it's automatic. Although land is a national property, farmers have right to use it, exchange, or transfer this use right to others. Inherit the land, use the right of land use as collateral for borrowing, and contribute value of that right of land use to form this And finally, in 2019, 
of agricultural land in Vietnam belong to household and only 9% belong to state farm or other businesses. Such distribution of land get farmers direct access to the land, but also led to fragmentation of funding. So in average, a farm household has little more than one hectare. But we, uh, we can see from this table, so less than 0.2 hectare in, nine, in 2006 was 32 percent. And between 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 36, it means two thirds has less than half of hectare. Yeah, only 6% has more than two hectares. Just because they, uh, they have more uh, members in the family or they uh, inherit uh, in the, from the past. The government did and in average a farm household has land in many places. In average in seven to eight places. So imagine only 02 hectare. Oh two hectare. But in eight places. So some some farmer has a lot of land, that's enough for buffalo to go one way. No return. Very small. Data for shared area possessed by each group. Yeah. We can ask questions later. Yeah. This is official survey, government survey. Yeah. So we, we see that problem, and that's why government have been trying to promote consolidation of land. So first by exchange, and then we, we encourage them to form cooperative or even to buy from each other. But after 15 years, you can see we, we have even more you know, uh, uh, fragmented uh, land situation. Uh, in seven number of uh, uh, share of households with less than 0.2 hectare went up from 32 to 42 percent, 10 percent more. But percentage of those with more than two hectares went up only 0.07 percent. Very little. <laughs> Since the reform began, the land law has been changed every 10 years. And every time we met farmer rights, Clearer, more and clearer and more stable in order to encourage them to invest and take care of the land. And now that we are discussing a new land law, difficult for me to say what will be, but certainly national property will remain and we intend to make it more market oriented. But 
overrun with farmers who are really emperors, embrace with the new land policy. They were encouraged to invest in and take care of the land distributed to their family. I did survey, house, farmhouse survey, and I asked the question, what would you like most in the early 90s? And the answer was, land. And we did that. We distributed land to them. They were extremely happy. That mostly relates to property land. But we also reform the state farm by applying contract system, but with more benefit to workers. As to the market mechanism, since the reform began, there has been a continuous process of the market liberalization and integration. By now, almost all prices of agricultural inputs and outputs are determined by the market, but not only domestic, but already uh, Inter internationalized the market. Almost all subsidies were removed. For some time, the supply was was kept, but what is on the election fees? As an economist, I already this, but Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, political win uh, is stronger. But after some time, you know, we see that it's not good for both uh, farmers and the government. That might be still water fees, right? And most of the barrier to entering or existing were removed or diminished. More than that, Vietnam have opened the domestic market for international business. Many companies from India and other countries, as well as multinational companies, came to invest in Vietnam agriculture. Now that Vietnam is a member of 70 anti national or bilateral free trade agreements, including FTA, comprehensive and progressive agreement for Trans Pacific Partnership or Vietnam, EU, and FDA, uh, this most recently, regional uh, Liber comprehensive economic partnership. Those FDA include almost all the country products of Vietnam. That's why Nobel international competition is spent strongly even in the domestic market. No place in Vietnam, no international cooperation, uh, competition. Market institutions have been established and continuously improved. No mon monopolies, no trust are allowed. We diminish. and in the, of the market markets 
were carried out in close coordination with other sectors in the economy. Trade liberalization and integration brought powerful incentives for farmers to invest in our country. Most farmers now became commercialized. They have learned to work with the market signals. As to restructuring big and state farm, after the reform, cooperatives change their function. So, you can know, in the past, they, they set plans, they set targets, and they organize farmer work to work, to implement, and farmer work share at the end of the year. Now, farmer work, each farm household got a block of land, and they plant, I can say, mostly any block they like. They send produces to anyone they like. They buy input from anyone they like. But cooperative has also function to carry out. Instead of planning, instead of organizing, now they do only services to farm household. And they do only that services individual farmer could not do or do it inefficiently. Like water management. This is and in new system, farmers became more same brilliant. The farm will restructure as well. First, we review their land and they return to the state those land they did not use efficiently in order to distribute to farmers. And they apply deeper contract system. So plantation of tea, of coffee, of rubber will give them to farmers for taking care. And for that, farmer has to pay only certain percentage to step up and retain the rest for them. That's why right. farmers invest even more input than state farm provided to them in order to get more about the, the, the set target. Even animal has one to set farm also get animals to work for taking care in the same way. And many state farm you know, get land with plant plantation to workers to do farming and in the same way. At the same time, many private companies invest in land. And there are also big companies. And not only domestic ones, but also Mantai, national, inter uh, uh, foreign companies. In 2020, there were 9 million farming households in Vietnam and 7,900 active property and 7,500 habitants. As to restructuring public services, first ready. Before the reform, there were only public banks and they provided most for 
ready to cooperate and stay firm. Now the private banks and private cooperatives are also low. There are now 124 banks and 1,200 funds of cooperatives and 60 finance companies providing credit to agricultural and rural sectors. The government has been given priority to providing credit to agricultural and rural sectors. The state bank set a ceiling interest, normally lower, lower than to other sectors. And they set a policy to allow banks to provide credit without collateral up to 122,000 US dollars to a farm household of property. That's quite large amount. The rates of annual increase of credit to agricultural and rural sectors has been higher than the average rate to the whole economy. In April 2022, total outstanding amount of credit to agricultural and rural sector was nearly 120 billion US dollars, which occupied 25 percent of total amount of credit to the to home economy. The government created several subsidized credit schemes for the poor and for specific purposes like promotion of high tech application in America. As to infrastructure, the government needs support from the international donor has been mobilizing resources in upgrading and development of good infrastructure, including road, irrigation, electricity, combined network, and the government committed, for example, uh, during the period 2008-2020, the government number investment in agriculture and rural sectors every five years. And that happened. And now uh, the, the, there is a commitment to double in the public investment in this decade compared to the last one. However, Total social investment in agriculture, including both the public and private, uh, in 2021 occupied only 4.5% of total investment in the economy. And for last decade, quantity of investment in agriculture in the winter has been slapping. And the share has been declining. So, absolutely sorry. The last share of public investment was allocated for development of irrigation. Nearly two thirds of the budgets allocated through the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and I was the minister, was used for development of irrigation. As a result, nobody, 95% of rice land is water. 95%. In 2010, the national program of rural development was initiated. For last decade, the program has produced strong impact on rural livelihood. By 2020, there are 99 
ตัวเสียงคนนึงยิ่งจะทำดีไปดิคันที่อินทูโปรวินซีสดิสทริกคอมมูนแอนด์เดนวิลลิจส่ง99เปอร์เซ็นต์คนนึงฮัสเมนโรฮัสฟันติโอคาบอลวิทคันทริกส96ของวินดิสิสมีอัตโนมัติคอนเนคชั่น 100% ของคนอินเดย 99.5% ของรูรัลฮาวส์โฮมโอคอนเนคติดกับทางภาคภูมิอิเล็กทริกสัปปายเน็ตเวิร์กดีกว่าเบลล์ของรูรัลอินฟราสตรักเจอร์ประมุ่งติดมาติดคอนเนคชั่นเอลอว์อินโอเค Most remote region, from a sensitive agriculture to a commodity-oriented one, and at the same time, we strengthen veterinary and production and plant production services as to research and extension. The government has been investing. In development of public research and extension network, research by private businesses was encouraged also, and extension network is to serve mostly property and sector. Now they turn mostly on assisting farm households. And since 2015, Vietnam allowed to grow GMO corn. Because we see that if we don't allow farmers to grow GMO corn, we have to import more and more. Because tra traditional corn has slow in it, four to five ton, but GMO corn seven ten ton per hectare. Despite official policy saying that we. The priority to development of research and extension, but public investment for research and extension in Vietnam is still low compared to the some other countries. And if we estimate it that Vietnam invests only 0.2 percent of GDP contribution from agriculture for research, so many impact. Of the reform, first you can see that uh, that uh, the green one is agriculture on the low rate, and red one is economy uh, as four. So for 1988, 2021, so more than 30 years, and you are able. The raw rate was 3.6 and 6 percent, so nearly 4 percent, which is high. In the same period, rice production almost tripled, and rice seen more than that one. And uh, from this chart, you can see. That uh, yellow is active increase and uh, green is lean increase. So you can see that lean contribute mostly to increase of rice production. Production of coffee, uh, red one, in 1990, almost low, but in one. One million eight hundred thousand tons. We can become second largest coffee producer in the world. The same with rubber and paper. So poultry has so increased five times. Has the cow and pig increased by uh, so cow. Two times and fixed two times. Fishery brought 
But in 1990, it was about 1 million tons, now about 9 million tons. So, almost 9 times. Forest coverage at the same time increased from 27%, now 42%. That is economic one. From social perspective, income of farmers has been improving fast, about 60, 60 times during the period 1993, 2021. And one, 16 times. Yeah. And, and as 90% of the poor are living in countryside, I can't run development for the duty. We must have to do faculty on liberation. So, faculty rate has been declining 1 to 2 percent a year. And in 1990, the rate was 60 percent following international standard. And in 2021, the rate was 4.4% following the national multi-dimensional standard. And Professor Mahura asked, what is poverty line? So now the poverty line is 85 US dollar per person per month for urban areas and $64 for rural areas. Yeah. So for countryside, $2. Dollars. But beside income, the poor household does not need six, uh, three over six other criteria on employment, healthcare, education, housing, drinking water. Overlapability and information. Agriculture and development and rural development help to reduce the gap between urban and rural areas, preventing excessive migration from rural areas to urban areas. Food abundance with low prices allow improved nutrition. The average age of population has been increasing from 65 in 1990 to 73.6 years in 2021. <laughs> and and by the way, I already informed you the coverage of forests increased from 27 to 42 percent. Now, not everything falls. We do have many issues. The main challenges, you know, that softly say, are for long. First, <clears throat> low expensive. In average, revenue from a hectare of crop land in 2021 was only $4,300. From a hectare a year. The income, that revenue, the income is about 30 to 50 percent of that, depending on the prices. <laughs> and secondly, low income and poverty among farmers. So, average monthly income in rural areas in 2021 was 148 US dollar per capita only for a month. And about 50% from agriculture. The gap in absolute in income between the rural and urban areas continue to widen 
Many farmers shift to non-farm activities, even migrate to urban areas. And third is en environmental degradation. So uh, not only pollution because of chemicals we are using, but also land degradation because of mechanization and overuse. Vulnerability to the climate change. It is forecasted that Vietnam will be among five the worst affected by the climate change countries in the world. And agriculture is the most vulnerable economic sector. I have been voting as chief commander of national effort for natural disaster mitigation. I think that very strongly, almost every day. Yeah. And, and besides that, agriculture is contributing 20% of greenhouse emissions at the time. And half of that from rice and we have to reduce that in order to carry out commitment of zero emission by 2050. So our future goal is in coming 20, 30 years, Vietnam aims to become among the developed countries through facilitated industrialization and modernization. Other countries share in GDP in decline below 10%. In some provinces, already only 2%. But agriculture will remain important economic sector and especially as a source of employment and income for large part of population. As you see, still 63% of population living in the countryside. And agriculture will continue to provide strong environmental base for sustainable development of the country. That's why our main goal is maintaining high growth of agriculture, make it inclusive and make it more environmental friendly. To achieve the goal goals, the policy reform will have to be continued. The main objective of the reform is to bring in new incentives for agriculture to sustain fast growth and those incentives may come from better functioning automatic mechanisms, but also from science technology, from infrastructure, from human resource development, as well as better governance. So many policy, uh, so many areas for further fine turning dramatic mechanism are uh, swallowed. First, the further improvement of land policy. Second, better functioning of the rural financial market to meet higher needs of farmers in Africa. Third, fine turning commodity market management to have increased competitiveness of national agricultural products of great more favorable environment for businesses to come and operate efficiently in agriculture. They will have to play a leading role in relation with smartphones. And fifth, not, not at least, strength and incentive for effective use of natural resources, reduction of emission and pollution, environmental protection, development of ecology friendly and country. Farmer asks why I have to reduce emission for whole world to combat climate change. We need that, but we need to give them incentives. 
and mighty things and grief that not possible. Over only for us for the case. The time has been carrying out step by step a soon market oriented reform in our country. It was comprehensive but not complete yet. The reform created strong incentive for farmers and businesses to use more efficiently land and other resources invest in our country. That was the main reason behind the success story. And first, the role in agriculture was to recognize as a strong base for economic growth and maintaining social stability in the country, especially during crisis time. For next two or three decades, agriculture continued to play important roles in economic, social development, as well as environmental protection. The market oriented policy reform has to be moved to bring about new incentives for further sustainable development of our country in Japan. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Park, uh, for a fascinating account of a long journey that we have done of uh, decades of uh, uh, journey from food shortage uh, to becoming a big exporter, the very products even to India now. Uh, so I would like to uh, start the uh, discussion uh, by inviting uh, to see our colleagues research collaborators of FAS uh, to uh, give a few remarks and then we will open it up for uh, questions and answers. So uh, can I call upon uh, Professor Venkatesh Atreya who is uh, now retired but has been Professor at the Department of Economics and Vice Chancellor at Bharatidasa University in Kandahar. Just thank you. 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 Thank those who have seen it in the audience, for us, Vietnam is Vietnam struggles of the 60s and 70s are extremely important to inspiring us to go beyond our personal life and get involved in global progressive advances. So, the remaining grateful to Vietnam is in itself, because Vietnam has continued to very carefully steer a course in a very complex and difficult world. Uh, so I think we must place on the part of the appreciation of the uh, role of Vietnamese people at the global level in sustaining the balance between democratic forces and other forces and uh, the accounting for agriculture in particular. Perhaps some, a lot of basically um, thoughts to share. Some terms when taken in different contexts have different meanings. Reform is an important word of that kind. Reform in India is such a name. But when our speaker is speaking about reform, it's in a different context altogether within the framework of very restricted inequality in land ownership. Because of a big landlord class in the countryside, we did have no how to, you know, we the challenge of increased food production, food production has to increase, but at the same time, we don't want to uh, create large. Contradictions in the countryside. That's a challenge that's uh, not easy to meet. And I think that Vietnam uh, again has taught us some lessons, just as think of it also from other work that scholars have done. Uh, there were some um, points repeatedly coming through in the presentation. It says that although we 
away from the legs of cockpit forms and state forms to ozone forming, which is the central feature of the reform, but maintaining the national character of landed and property. This is also very really important, I think. The debates about this in Chinese context as well, and some are inclined to even going for privatized land ownership. So, in fact, there's one place that you mentioned uh, so much of land belongs to farm households, they are selling to the house, you should probably be saying all the possession of households don't necessarily belong to them. So, they don't have a right to transfer. So, it takes a way to check on the growth of land ownership of any kind. This is a thing that we have inherited from the past. It's also interesting to see that India still has a larger share of rural population total than Vietnam. 70, I mean 67, 62, roughly. From the 2011 census, they don't have a census for a very long time. And the share of agriculture, I mean of, of labor force in agriculture, is also higher, 30% rural Vietnam. It's somewhat uh, lower than ours, which is actually about 40 percent plus. So, in both respects, Vietnam is more organized and more modern than its much larger Indian counterpart. Though you may not always see it that way, I think I'm, I find it very interesting. Uh, what would I, what would you like to know more about? It's clear that even when you talk about you know reform giving households greater space for initiative, which I think makes a lot of sense. The role of the state has also had to be supported. You just sort of come back and say that, you know, the state has to do this for the infrastructure, for this, that, and the other. So, you know, reform in India would imply something called privatization. Here, it doesn't mean that. It means, you know, the role of small producers being recognized, the state working together with them, offering them support systems. You keep reiterating that no subsidies. That, you know, in the Indian context, there's a very different meaning. Because here, the farmer is completely unequally placed in the uh, largest scheme of things. So here, subsidy is critical to survival. In your context, the state is providing certain kinds of support, and you have a great deal of inequality in land and other ownership. Then, of course, it's, you know, this, the role of the state has to be different there. Uh, but I'm also there are many things that I need to know to really fully understand your lecture. That's why I'm struggling with it and trying to understand all the points you're making. Mm. But it's not, if I had, for example, data, you have one table where you've shown uh, how, what is the percentage of households processing between zero point, less than 0 0.2 hectares, between 2 0.2 and 0 0.5, and so on, for two different points in time. What might be helpful is we also have shares of area possessed by these class size, size categories, which will then tell us whether between point in time one, which is earlier, and 2021, or what most is the such your data, whether there is a significant increase in some index of concentration of land position, not ownership position, and whether a class of large landholders with position rights emerge. And do they then does that in turn have political implications in terms of their you know uh, ability to influence policy, uh, their presence in the countryside, the kind of political power that they may exercise? We don't know. This is something you of course have been in pick up. It's interesting to know whether uh, you see as you go towards you keep talking about increasing support for market oriented reforms. Again, that's a, in a term that's can be a bit weird. I think it's, it's a, in your context, I understand it. I would like to know whether that has led to significant increase in inequality in position of land holdings and of other assets. You know, that's and we take consumption data. How those income savings you have? That would be quite interesting. We basically infer from consumption data for the economy. But I mean, there are many more things to discuss. I think that yeah, I would like a lot more participation from the audience. So I'm going to stop here. So I need to digest the content and take some time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Venkatesh, and uh, 
has given the Indian context how in the growth study in the Indian economy, uh, what we are used to normally when we look at uh, data on the growth of the economy and how we have given a different perspective. I would invite uh, Professor R. Ramkumar, uh, RBI Chair Professor and former Dean of the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. Thank you, Maria. To begin with, uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Park for a very fascinating lecture that he gave today. Uh, from, from at least my childhood, from my student days, uh, he's been a greatly inspirational figure. And, and anything about Vietnam has been thoroughly fascinating to read from your audience. Uh, so, so, thank you very much for that uh, lecture that you gave us. Uh, I think something that struck me very hard when I was reading through the text of uh, Dr. Park's paper was how young Vietnam is as a country. Uh, in fact, it must be the youngest Asian country. Uh, 1975, uh, the year of its real independence and not from 1945. Uh, the only examples that come afterwards are, say, Rhodesia uh, in 1980, in Africa or South Africa in 1994 and so on. But 1975, starting the development process in 1975 makes you a real young country, uh, young independent country in the Asian part of the world. And that's really fascinating given the distance of power from 1975. The fascinating feature for me was that. The second fascinating feature for me was, it was a bit Shocking, I didn't know this. The extent of share of forests that you have in the total geographical area. It's absolutely, I, I was totally uh, surprised to see the figure of 42% of area under forest. I'm going to come to that in a little while. But this essentially creates enormous constraints to diversify your economy uh, into an industrial uh, economy and so on. Uh, but, but having increased your forest area from 29% to 42%. Uh, not just that it's a remarkable achievement, but on the other side, I think it creates some constraints, uh, which I shall try to come to towards uh, the last part of my course. Uh, your, your lecture uh, very comprehensively covered uh, the history of collectivization uh, of agriculture between 1975 and 1986, when you had significant land reform, uh, in cooperativization of agriculture, uh, you had uh, nationalization of land, uh, uh, which essentially ended all feudal uh, elements in the agrarian structure. Uh, that that was an, an extraordinary achievement of the first ten years. Uh, this this essentially lays the foundation for all future future progress uh, in terms of uh, not just an initial condition but also an essential agrarian structure that gives a fillet to future uh, economic growth in the country itself. Uh, then you speak about the context of Doi uh, where you point out that the collectivization of agriculture did not uh, result in the kind of uh, increase of productivity or investment that uh, you would have expected. And that's something that you will learn also from the Chinese and Cuban experiences in cooperativization as well. And both Cuba and China are parallels in this regard. I'm sure you will agree with me that the whole balance that came into being between the, the relations of production on the one side and forces of production on the other, the lack of harmony between the rapid advance of productive forces and the lagging relations of production creates enormous rural tensions, as it did in China during the 1970s. And, 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 and that's uh, clearly a context in which you move into a market-oriented uh, uh, economy afterwards. Uh, you, you decide to use more of individual incentives, use more of markets, price signals, etc. Uh, in the agrarian structure, but you keep land as nationalized. Uh, you do provide land on lease, first for 20 years, then for 50 years. So it's essentially an ownership-like regime that you have in the rural area, so it's not ownership, uh, uh, essentially. Uh, now, that's where I put my first uh, question. 
if you look at the Chinese experience from 1978, uh, Deng Xiaoping, for instance, spoke about when they liberalized, when they had their going away, uh, they spoke about two leaps, as I understand. The first leap was uh, to utilize private incentives to the maximum. Uh, private uh, entrepreneurial spirits to the maximum and take advantage of growth that will come from that. But then, then, Deng Xiaoping spoke about the second leap that China must uh, encounter, say, 20 years or 30 years from now, that's roughly now, uh, which is essentially about recollectivizing the economy. Once you have mobilized the social capital from uh, the uh, freeing up of collectives, uh, though not fully, but partially, how do you bring back economies of scale into farming? How do you bring back uh, uh, the, the social ownership of land? How do you bring it back and create new benefits from that growth? Is Vietnam thinking about something like a second leap of that sort? Are there, are there uh, elements of a re cooperativization that we uh, see at least in, in some parts uh, in, in Vietnam. Uh, no, that's one question that I have. Uh, uh, but then, Don Moy had enormous achievements. Productivity, productivity grows uh, very rapidly. Investment happens uh, on a large scale. Uh, your poverty levels fall. Uh, your production rises. Your food security uh, is much more secure today than it was in the 80s. Uh, Vietnam has also incidentally gained enormously from the WTO. I worked with the state planning board in Vietnam, and one of the constant complaints that we get is that Vietnamese pepper and Vietnamese cashew are flooding the Kerala market and uh, creating problems for us. In fact, Vietnamese pepper first comes to Sri Lanka, and because India and Sri Lanka have a free trade agreement, Vietnamese pepper comes as Sri Lankan pepper into India. So that's uh, that's a side part of the story, but but I, I, but, but, but the, you know, the ability of Vietnam to make available agricultural commodities in the world market at competitive prices is for the achievement for sure, even if it is about the other unequal uh, uh, impacts that uh, the people has had in the developing world. Uh, but despite this growth, your own paper points out that per capita incomes in the rural areas are still very low. Uh, your public investment is still low. Uh, in fact, public investment in agricultural research is about 0.2% of agricultural GDP. That's one third of what India has. So India is about 0.6% uh, is invest investment in agricultural research as a share of agricultural GDP. Though in the developed part of the world, it's 2%, 3%, and so on. Uh, you, you yourself point about point out Brazil, which is 1.8, where it is very high. Uh, so public investment is still low, and you may be uh, reaching a plateau in terms of paddy productivity. You already have six tons per hectare, you can go up to six, eight, seven, or eight. But then you are looking at other crops now. So there's enormous potential in other crops like corn. You mentioned where you introduced uh, uh, the GMO varieties and hybrids, uh, where there is enormous scope for increased productivity. I'm sure, uh, and poverty levels are still. Uh, if you take a $3 standard, that would be uh, higher than what you have cited. And also, from what I understand, compared to the uh, compared to the Kin and Hoa groups, poverty is disproportionately concentrated among the ethnic minorities uh, in, in, in rural Vietnam. And uh, that must be a matter of concern and something that uh, must be driving new tensions in the society. So I would like to know uh, uh, how how broad-based has poverty decline in the rural areas been, and, 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 and what are Vietnam's plans in that regard? The last point that I wanted to mention as we're coming back to forests uh, is this rise of forest area from 29% to 42% of the geographic, geographical area must have been creating enormous constraints uh, in, in the direction of the economy. Now, he speaks about forest farms. Is it, in his paper, he speaks about forest farms. So I would like to know how, what are these forest farms, and how does this increase of forest area from 29 to 42 percent? Yeah, benefit the farmers. 
So is it is it uh, is it something that happens under a state company or a state corporation, or is it something that directly benefits from? I'm, 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 I'm eager to know about it. Uh, the last point is uh, about uh, the future of industrialization uh, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, this increase, Vietnam is getting into new spaces vacated by China, uh, particularly in textiles and other uh, such industrial areas. But given this constraint of area uh, that you have, how does Vietnam plan to industrialize and diversify its economy? Thank you very much, and thank you again for your very fascinating uh, lecture. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have to invite you for the second seminar for the last question on industrialization. So, uh, okay, so let me just open it up and take some more questions and uh, then uh, uh, Dr. Pat can answer them all together. So, any other comment, question? Okay, just to be short. Uh, someone there? Are you pointing at someone, uh, Okay, I think people are digesting the vast uh, information and the uh, strategies. Yeah, okay. So, okay. so if you would like to take a look at it. Yeah, go ahead. Can you give me the mic, please? Oh, yeah, yeah. Give your name, please. My name is Sandhya. I teach at RD University. Uh, I'm just curious to know what is the uh, if the state controls all the land, what are the is there a misuse of land in some way? Because, uh, what, is it a kind of land grabbing concentration from the state? Is there other cases or instances of that happening in provinces that maybe you could talk about? Because we have a lot of land grabbing in the Indian context, so I'm just curious to know if we have patterns in India. So, so, this is the local province. Are we in charge of the election land or is it misuse of the given people? Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, actually, uh, I uh, I remember very very to to Indian government people for training. I can say very good and some uh, researchers <coughs> for agriculture people. 60s, in 70s, and 80s, and really I, I came here not really to speak, I, I just tell you a story uh, and inform you, and I really look forward to learning from hearing from the professor's suggestion as well. Uh, and so now about your question. First, uh, you know, we are really embarrassed with the market uh, before, market already before. It really brings <coughs> such strong incentives. So you, 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 you heard that we have nine million smartphones. So no money for any government to influence every among nine million households. So all the million only they have twenty thousand arm and they have the list of them. And they, and they, they can follow. And now we can and in India say the only way to influence is to institute structure. Through policies, and that we did. And I, I feel so strong. And I feel very strong. I can, I can tell you that. Uh, you can see a minister going around talking what Indian did. 
for 20 years as minister, every day I'm thinking of policy. Every day and night. And I've been waiting all the time for advice on policy. That is, and, and that's what I, I, I've been doing. And what an uh, example of uh, the reform I'm bringing for you. Actually, my intention was to clear the environment for the market to walk and by the by the by that way to bring in market incentives. And when I, when I say it may make it subsidies, I mean direct subsidies to farmers, but the government continues to yeah. You know, following WTO uh, you know, agreement. So we, we invest in infrastructure, in science, technology, uh, extension, and so in order not to destroy the market. Uh, so, but first of all, the most important was land policy report. And as I inform you, that when I ask farmer, what do you want? Most, they say, land. But that's why we focus on that. And, and we, we distribute the land equally. And farmer love land so much. Now they don't, even many of them ship to the city, they think it, land, in fact, you said, they do not sell. They do not sell. And, this is uh, land consolidation, but it not happen. <laughs> you see. So yeah, you you are afraid that that, that policy may lead to big farm and, and land lease, but it did not happen. And and you see that even not can so now, with new land law, we are trying to clear, clarify even more market mechanism to allow the land consolidation, more selling, more leasing, and we hope it will work in order to have more larger scale coming. So, you ask, uh, how about the poverty line? Uh, yes, uh, poverty is more in mountains. Uh, among ethnic minority, in some places now 30, 40 percent, not 4 percent, has fallen economy. Uh, and and how, how do we, how do we define that? Uh, we we set uh, standard and local authority. Outline. So there is no such uh, uh, income service in Vietnam yet. Yeah. Mm. And uh, Professor Nampura uh, asked uh, if we think of uh, second lift like in China, uh, <coughs> yes, we are looking for new incentives to maintain high growth of agriculture, but at the same time to make it inclusive, environment, environment friendly, um, but by, by the collectivization, I would not be so. I, I do not think of uh, advising the government to, to in any way to, you know, to... Uh, How do you create economies of scale? Yes. Uh, we want to, in, at least I'm thinking, and I'm advising, to use small market mechanism for that. To, uh, to, uh, to allow farmers who don't who do to do farming to lease or sell their right and allow those who can invest and invest in 
what this shape coming lead to at least a body found, a body line is right going to a holder, rather than it's in static questions that we are thinking. And that we are commanding new land law. And, and yes, this is, uh, you know, besides trying to increase productivity or price of quality of everything, we are trying to allow farmers to diversify their crop and activities. Uh, and, and you asked about uh, forest. I was accused of uh, you know hindering uh, industrial migration by limiting by limiting the uh, version of agricultural land, especially rice wine in Vietnam. Color post why don't you it must be maintained for future generation. And it is exempt <coughs> for sustainability. So, so yes, we, we need land. We need land. We, we amend the land law to allow conversion, but, but twice conversion of agricultural land for industry, for 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 cities, for infrastructure, for other crops, we can write, but it should be white rather than blue. And we can accuse. And then, ladies, uh, question. Yes, in our system, we delegate authority uh, from central government to provincial to district. So, provincial government monitor land use of enterprises and district authority monitor land use of farmhouse homes. You ask if any overview of uh, uh, misuse of land. There is but there is very strict system of monitoring. Thank you. I think this is starting off a second seminar of, uh, with the questions of Thank you so much for the lecture. It was great. Uh, I am from Maori University. So, uh, what happened to me after the whole session was uh, to look at uh, the role that agriculture can play towards uh, tourism. Is there any intervention of agro tourism uh, that is mentioned in the yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, uh, just say for the mic, the recording is available. My name is Trishti. I'm from Azim Gandhi University. Uh, my question is uh, broadly. Foundation. 
very impressive talk and thank you very much. You have touched upon two important dimensions. One is the infusion of uh, technology to the parents of farmers, especially GMOs. For several years now, corn, uh, GM corn is getting grown there, and they specifically for the pesticide and testing. And uh, so far, you have any, uh, observed any adverse effects? And what is the message you wanted to give to India for the adoption of these technologies? This is number question number one. Question number two, you also talk about an important dimension of usage of water with respect to climate change, a specific uh, tax or a assess to the, to the users. You know, analogy, in, in case if I have to take an analogy in India, at one point of time, road users never face a pay at all and we, uh, we have difficulty in commuting, but today with the uh, toll roads, you know, commutation is a very convenient one. Similarly, for if we uh, are going to charge water, then can we assure, uh, can you assure the farmers, assure the supply of water at a difficult time and uh, uh, hand holding and things like that? Do you have any suggestions to make? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. I uh, have a couple of questions. Right, thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting question. First about uh, alcohol tourism. Yes, we are thinking of that. Uh, and in reality, there are uh, many uh, co party uh, doing alcohol tourism in Vietnam. Uh, maybe I am biased, but I love to go around you know, to see rice fields, plantation. I think you would want to. Please uh, come to the town. At harvest time, to see that. We need them to break the Resistance. My email 
akal pelatih harus meter you know protesting so that why I need it very very you know carefully but international sama and you can openly you know, invite press invite a farmer to come and see and and when they are convinced you are low to your own but you know argument is why would you do to it corn uh, or something else with more, more pesticide or you do game of corn <laughs> and argument is why don't you allow Vietnamese farmers to grow GMO corn and import GMO corn? Uh, Nine million corn last year. Yeah. But in country we produce only one million corn. So, and GMO corn has to increase farmer income. But negative impact, I don't see yet. Sometimes I, I shop, I say, Look, American people use GMO for details, and they very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and uh, I hope, and as to uh, water use, yes, you know, uh, in the past, in the 80s, in the 90s, we used to apply water fees. And then the government see that farmer are poor and they try to help farmer by listing not only land use tax but also water fees. Because later we found that if we, we make the water <coughs> no chance free, then there is tendency of, of overuse of water misuse of water and we cannot supply enough water for you know for such so only three years. We never that's why and we don't have uh, money to maintain the system the government will that's why we install again so called not water this but irrigation that is the, our, our idea is to use magic mechanisms to encourage efficient use of water instead of administrative distribution of, of water. Uh, thank you. I think we should, uh, okay, last quick term. Last statement. That is that we also, we appreciate your argument for using what you call market incentives. But we also suggest that there will be a strong business in the state, very investment rate of traction, by ensuring that the overall process and the path and the outcome for democratic impact. I would now like to address the question of you and invite uh, Sujan. Uh, to come and give the uh, official vote of thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Madhav On behalf of the Foundation, I would like to start with uh, thanking today's speaker, Dr. Prabhupada, for taking time and for his uh, com very comprehensive presentation of the reform process that has transformed the countryside of Vietnam. I would also like to thank the chair of today's event, Dr. Samantha Swaminathan, for facilitating such an important presentation. My heartiest thanks to the International Rice Research Institute for thinking about this event along with us and staying through the process. Uh, also, very important has been the contribution of St. Joseph's University, who has given us the place to conduct this uh, event. And this is also the second time that we are conducting such an event in St. Joseph's University, and uh, we would hope this collaboration will continue in coming years also. I'd also like to especially thank the technicians uh, who have helped us for the smooth sailing of this program and also the student volunteers who stayed long beyond their uh, classes for uh, you know, smoothing the 
context of the lecture. Uh, uh, special thanks to, we are also thankful to Dr. Professor Clement de Souza and the economic, the economics department for coordinating everything that has happened today. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, the various faculties from different universities, departments, uh, uh, for making arrangements of to bring their students along with them, uh, particularly RV University, Azizhuang University, Christ University, ISEC, Dr. Gerard Victor School of Economics University, and of course, St. Joseph's University. Uh, thank you very much, uh, especially to the faculties who have you know, helped us coordinate continuously uh, to have a good evidence in this event. I would also like to thank uh, Janashakti Media for uh, being here and helping us record and live stream this event today. Uh, I, expect, I, I take this opportunity to also express special gratitude to the many senior academics and scholars who have come here from different parts of Bangalore and elsewhere to attend the lecture. Uh, I thank the audience who believe that uh, we are taking away something to think and consider. Uh, there is much to think about after such a comprehensive account of the Education reforms in Vietnam, and uh, a lot to think about uh, such policies for our own country. Finally, I thank the team at FAS, everyone who has worked toward making this event uh, for ensuring the success of this event, uh, and for planning and conducting, uh, in conducting this operation. Uh, last thing, tea and snacks and refreshments are outside the hall. I hope uh, please on your way out. Uh, and also please consider, we, we have put some of the publications of the foundation outside. Please consider taking a look at them. Thank you.